Oh, let me put my phone on vibrate. Hi, it's Sherry Roberts, and we're back with our series of community conversations with uh, community leaders about the coronavirus. And today we're talking with Santa Barbara Police Chief Lori Lunau. Thank you so much for being with us, Chief. Hi, Jerry. Thanks for having me. Look, I know it's kind of an oxymoron to talk about a typical day in law enforcement, but um, what's a typical day like for you and how has it changed uh, since the pandemic started shutting everything down? Um, you know, I think the one thing we admit in this profession is there is no typical day. And fortunately, we are trained to adapt and overcome and this pandemic is no different. Uh, for me personally, this has shifted my world a lot more online and like a lot of people, it's been information overload with teleconferences. Um, a lot of our effort, um, when I say our, it's my command staff, is in communicating and overly communicating to our people because we have 209 employees here, they are working remotely and we are social distancing, so we don't have that day-to-day -day interaction. So we need to make sure we pass that information on as best as possible. So we have daily meetings with our managers, weekly meetings with our supervisors, all online. And we're doing our best to communicate with our infectious disease expert with the fire department and some of our medical staff so that we are passing on the best information we can with the focus of keeping ourselves safe so that our interactions with the community are safe as well as our families at home. So we're not taking any um, virus or exposure, unnecessary chances with exposures home with us. Right. Uh, you know, at, you, you've been uh, in law enforcement for a long time and I imagine you've done a lot of training exercises and pro professional development courses, scenario planning. Did it ever include a pandemic? Was that ever a scenario that you uh, that you trained for? You know, I recall in my prior days in San Diego, we did train on biochemical weapons and what that would look like. Um, but I don't recall any specific takeaway that looks like this that we're dealing with. Yeah. So I think the most difficult piece of it is we don't have a lot of information. Our, our medical profession is learning as we go. The world is learning as we go. So, you know, we're used to doing, gathering intelligence, getting information and making decisions based on that. And this is one we're just kind of flying by the seat of our pants in regards to adapting hour by hour with the information that comes in. Yeah, I told someone the other day that one of the only good things about getting old is you can always compare something that happens to something else, but I don't have anything to compare this to. I mean, it's just such an extraordinary and unique event. Um, was there a, a light bulb moment when this went on uh, for you that said, holy cow, this is really serious? Were you following what was going on? Or, you know, I know the president was trying to downplay it. Uh, how, did that, uh, how did that work for you? I think one of the most, um, uh, I think, critical conversations that I was a part of, or I, I should say a conversation that opened my eyes the most was with one of the ER docs uh, from Cottage who happens to be the medical director for the fire department that works closely with us. And he has some history uh, and experience with infectious disease control. So from his mindset in regards to there's there's no vaccination we don't have herd immunity the reality of how this could impact us and more importantly how this could overrun the hospitals was probably one of the most um i think meaningful conversations because there's just so much information out there it's hard to trust it but when you get it from somebody you trust that you know is a reliable resource it it makes it mean a little more yeah I, I guess what one uh, employee of the department has tested positive for the coronavirus, is that correct? That's correct, we had one positive test. Are there tests available to the, to the department uh, beyond you know, what would be available to the general public? In other words, it seems to me that as frontline you know, first responders that you ought to be in line for that. What's the situation on that? Yes, we use our resource with the fire department, the infectious disease um, battalion chief who gets in touch 
with Cottage and we are included in that tier one level for testing. So they work through the health department to ensure we get that testing expedited to the best of their ability. So has everyone had a test or is it only when people become sick? Um, so only those that have been sick and symptomatic um, in a way that could be COVID-19. So I believe we've had three people tested. So two came back negative and the one came back positive. Okay. All right. Um, I want to go back on uh, April 20th, you had a news conference and you talked about uh, an uptick in, in crimes and I think specifically uh, aggravated assaults and robberies uh, were up. Has that trend, has that uptick continued since then or was that a statistical anomaly or what, what's, what's your perspective on that? So, um, first of all, when we compared the numbers for the same period last year, the, the sample was very small. So right. when, when I said we had an uptick, you know, it was anywhere from two to five more instances. Um, I'm happy to say that the last week and a half have appeared to um, relax a little and we haven't seen that trend continue. So um, I'm optimistic, you know, there's a lot of law abiding citizens out here that are doing just that and following the health department directives and CDC directives. And um, we are grateful for that. And we're actually seeing about a 40% reduction in radio calls to the department as a whole. Really? Yes. Oh. Okay. Um, what about the release of inmates? I know, I guess there were several hundred who were released uh, for fears of the coronavirus. Has, have you seen any impact on the street in terms of uh, uh, calls or policing issues that have, that that's uh, uh, been re resulted in? Um, the one thing I, I will say very um, happily is we have some very good investigators and police officers here with the Santa Barbara Police Department. So when those crimes have occurred, the robberies and assaults that we had the slight uptick in, uh, they went and they found people and we got several suspects in custody. And what we found is those suspects for the most part had prior criminal his histories. A couple of them were released because of the early release program due as a result of this pandemic. So, you know, anecdotally we can say we've seen them involved in some crime and that goes back to my prior statement of, you know, law abiding citizens are still law abiding citizens. And I think some people just, resort back to what's known and comfortable for them because that's how they've survived for so long prior to this. Yeah, you had some pretty tough words that day. You said that this is a time that people who prey on the community do not uh, get a, a free pass. Um, is that what you were referencing specifically? Absolutely. We um, are aggressively investigating and we throw all of our resource at those significant crimes. It's one of those I should say the violent crime is one of those bookable offenses still. And we recognize if somebody is hurting somebody, they definitely need to be in custody. So we're fortunate to be in a situation where we've been fully staffed. Um, some people that would have normally been on vacation have had to cancel their vacation, so they're here at work. So we've got a team of investigators, I believe 15 in our bureau right now, and uh, they hit the streets with all their might and have done a great job tracking down some suspects. Yeah, you talked about targeted suppression initiatives. What does that mean in English? <laughs> in English, it means we are using data and um, statistics to our favor to do what we can to mitigate crime. So from a general crime suppression, suppression standpoint, we use that information to anticipate crime from certain subjects or certain locations. And we do what we can to kind of break up that crime triangle of, um, crime triangle is a whole nother theory that in community policing, but you know, you take one of those arms of that crime away, meaning you change the behaviors of the victim, you change the behaviors of our suspect or the actual location, then it's hard for that crime to occur. Okay. What uh, effect have you seen about the fact that you know, schools have been shut down. Are you seeing more issues with uh, students, young people on the street? We have seen some pockets of more juveniles out on the streets and some of them on the playgrounds, not, you know, not intending to do anything wrong other than 
um, unfortunately breaking that social distancing directive. So um, it, it makes sense, I get it. They're not in school and a lot of times they may not be supervised or they're just bored to death. But um, we put two officers in charge of warning and educating our community and they've been out on a daily basis uh, approaching groups of people and giving them information on social distancing and, and directives. And I think they've shown a very positive impact um, over the last few weeks of doing that. Our officers, um, are they enforcing uh, social distancing, physical distancing um, uh, regulations, uh, six feet, or are they offering advice, or how does that work? So it is a directive from the health department. So with that being a directive and not a specific law, we are educating and warning people with the information. And are officers equipped with um, uh, PPE? To, uh, what, what, what's different in the way that they're out there in terms of equipment and protection and so forth? Um, so we, from the very beginning, um, went online with, again, that infectious disease experts protocol, and we instituted several procedures within the department. And to give you an example, I'll tell you how my day starts. Um, I'm directed to walk into one door of the police facility like everybody else that comes in. Um, I dip my shoes in a bleach bath before I walk into the building. I have to have my mask on um, at all times in the station. I'm supposed to maintain that social distancing. I do a self-assessment right when I get in that that first door with a temperature check to make sure I don't have a fever. And there's several questions I self answer and that's how I start my day. And I just had a command staff meeting in my office. Everybody was six feet apart and we all had our masks on. And that's the first time that we've all met in person um, since April, what was it, 12th? Um, so it, it's, it's taken very seriously. So our officers all have masks. Uh, we don't have an endless supply, so we're doing a great job using the same masks over and over. But then we also have some other protective gear in the cars um, in regards to uh, suits and things of that nature. So when you would, when the officers might, would encounter someone on the street, you know, who's being disruptive for whatever reason, how, how, would, how would it be different? How would they approach him? I mean, normally I assume they would go up and speak. Did they social distance? How does that work? I mean, what are, what are, what are their general orders for that? Um, their general orders are to maintain that social distancing when they can and to have their mask on at all times. And uh, we also directed them when they go to radio calls, for example, if they all don't have to go into the same location, have a, we call it a scout officer, but we know there's a difference when you're reporting crime versus being engaged in a tactical situation. Um, so it's a balance. If, if they're responding to a violent situation and somebody, for example, comes up and attacks them, it's unlikely, and I don't want them to think about going to their mask first. They have their self-protection tools that is probably gonna be a priority before their mask. But we recognize we're still getting out of our cars, we're contacting people, we're still arresting them. So we're doing what we can to keep our officers safe. But then also if we're in that close of a contact where we have to take somebody to jail, we're putting a mask on them as well. Well, for example, this knucklehead the other night at the, uh, uh, down at the harbor, or a dominant uh, Saganiti, uh, I can't imagine that would have been a situation where they, they would have been able to protect themselves. I mean, that, that sounded like it got pretty, pretty violent. How did that go down? Um, yeah, I know we responded to help Harbor Police with that call and um, very quickly our officers had to go hands on because the subject wasn't complying with verbal commands and not calming down. Um, and from there, I know they recognized a weapon and uh, the Harbor Patrol officer ended up using the taser. So they had the opportunity to then get the subject in custody. So that's one of those examples. Sometimes things are so dynamic and happen so quickly that 
frankly, they're worried about their lives immediately versus putting on a PPE. And I can't speak to if they had them on at the time, right. but yeah. as you know, those are scary situations for us. And, and that was one that we were happy with the outcome. Yeah, I can imagine. And, you know, I have to say, I, I'm, I'm just, I think to your credit, I can imagine how that would have gone down pretty differently, maybe even a, a few years ago, and certainly in a lot of other jurisdictions. And uh, it was good that was resolved without any uh, serious, more serious injury. Right. Going back to the protocol that you described when you went, when you go into the, into the office, uh, is that true for everyone? For example, in the dispatch center, I know that's pretty close quarters there until the new headquarters gets built next week or so, but um, what, what, what changes are, are hap have happened there? Are, are they six feet apart? So we initially put our dispatch center off, um, uh, I should say we, we disallowed any visitors for the first time since I've been here. So it was closed only to those employees that work there. Um, we have some officers assigned to assist because we have a couple staffing um, concerns on certain shifts and we assign them their full time. So first of all, we minimize the numbers of people turning over in that center they're doing their best to separate their workstations while they're there and maintaining their social distancing and wearing masks. That special order went out for the entire department at each of our different buildings that people need to wear a mask when they're potentially interacting with other people. So they have a temperature check and I'm pretty certain they have the, the foot dip as well, the shoe dip. Um, that one I can't speak to exactly because I haven't been over there. I haven't been allowed, but even the hardest thing for us, um, we had dispatcher appreciation week and we like to share the love with our dispatchers during that week. And we had to put it out for a future date because we weren't able to do that. How about the, uh, the briefings before a shift start? Um, how, has that changed at all? Is there anything significantly different there? Absolutely, they are different. We staggered some start times uh, for some different teams. So there's less here at the station at the same time. And then they're trying to uh, brief outside in a larger area. In fact, all myself and, and the command staff gave up our parking spots, which were covered underneath the parking garage that we are allowing for our employees now to have formal briefings outside. Okay. All right. Um, can you talk a little bit about the uh, homeless uh, people on the street and if there are differences in how you're handling those kinds of responses um, uh, under the circumstances? Sure. Yes. As a city, um, we are following the CDC guidelines in regards to not breaking up encampments and not encouraging our homeless population to um, disperse into different populated areas. So as a result, um, the Housing and Human uh, Development Services, which is a division of the city, brought in uh, several portable restrooms. I think there are eight different locations around the city and washing stations that um, basically provide whatever sanitized conditions they could for larger than normal encampments. So we aren't breaking them up. Um, we are still responding to crimes and any calls for service of any criminal activity, um, but we are asking for the community's patience during this time to um, help keep the overall community safe. And, and we figured that more centralized they are, the safer everybody else is. So that's that's why the uh, Kasik underpass, for example, there's a lot of lot of people there. So you would not, in other words, following the protocol again, you would not be breaking that up. Yes, that's why that restroom was placed there in the hand washing station. Our officers are there checking on that um, location a couple times a day, reminding people to leave the sidewalk open and. Uh, do what they can to keep it keep it passable for uh, community members that walk through the area. 
There were a number of reports over the weekend, um, some of them conflicting about what was happening on the beaches. What, what role does the department have in terms of our city beaches and, and patrolling there and maintaining uh, physical distancing and so on? So we as a department head team um, got together before this weekend recognizing we probably had one of the few open beaches in the region and the weather was going to be nice and there were going to be a lot of people. So we collaborated our waterfront department takes the lead as well as our park and rec folks with some of our lifeguard staff. Um, they were out in force, but uh, I know the fire department was out there training to show a presence. We directed a couple officers to be down there for a visible presence as well. And we all worked together, um, the Rangers included, to do our best to educate and warn, again, the community. And I'm happy to say we didn't have any situations that rose to a level that we needed police intervention. And for the most part, everybody deemed it as a, a successful weekend under the circumstances. Although, you know, as the governor often says that, you know, the virus doesn't know where the county lines are. So it's, it's you know, did you have any sense of whether folks on that, from the reports you received, folks on the beach were, were local or there, there were a lot of people coming from elsewhere? Um, you know, uh, Paul Co Casey, my boss, asked that question of department heads and nobody had a clear answer because I don't think they were interacting with people as much as they normally would. Um, but they did get a sense that there were several locals out and they thought for the most part it was a local crowd and the fact that the weather was so hot um, is what probably drove people there um, just to get a break from the hot weather. Yeah, I know uh, both uh, the district attorney and you have expressed concern about family violence and domestic abuse uh, while people are, are, you know, kind of locked up in their house. What have there been any circumstances? Have you got any read on that uh, at all? Uh, if that's uh, an increase, if it's a problem? Um, so I just received some statistics from the Cal, Cal Chiefs organization that I'm a part of. And of I think a third of the California agencies that responded to the survey, about 35% saw an uptick in reported cases of domestic violence. Um, we are not one of those cities that have seen the statistical increase, but we are very much aware that it's one of those crimes that occur behind closed doors. And if somebody doesn't feel safe asking for help, we're not going to see um, the call for service. So that's why in one of my last uh, press conferences, I recommended this is a time for family and friends to be that lifeline with people that they feel is in danger and to do what they can to check in um, to see if they need help or feel safe in their current environment. And if, and if someone is concerned, what should they do? If someone is concerned, they can call us um, and we can check the welfare to the best of our ability or there are some local resources, our district attorney, Victim Advocate is a great resource as well as uh, Domestic Violence Solutions. There's a 24-hour crisis hotline as well as shelter availability and also a organization that will take uh, domestic violence victims' pets for foster care because that's one of the things a lot of times people don't want to leave pets behind and they don't know that they can take their pets with them and make sure they're safe as well. All right. Um, let, me, let me just shift gears a little bit. Uh, I know there's a, a hearing on the budget uh, uh, today uh, at City Hall. Have you gotten any guidance or early indications of what your budget's going to look like uh, given the, the decline in revenue that we're seeing? Um, again, my boss, Paul Casey, has asked us all to come forward with some reduction strategies, and um, we're not sure how badly it's going to hurt, but um, he has openly said in some of his hearings, it, it's, it's going to be bad, and he hasn't seen anything like this before in, in his time as city administrator, and I think it's, what's, what's not sure is we don't know how bad the damage is when you look at, um, we don't know how long restaurants and bars are going to be closed. But then again, we don't know what sales tax is looming out there because some people have deferred their 
their sales tax payments to the to the state. So um, we're in the beginning stages of coming up with strategies, and you know, there's four different areas that have been identified as as ways to look at some reductions. Um, one of them we can't control. It's up to the labor unions to offer concessions. Um, the city council is the one that's going to be able to vote on using some of the reserves. And then it's us, up to us to look at um, possible service delivery cuts. And that's the one we're most, um, I think, in control of as a department. So we're, we're laying it out, trying to figure it out at this time and um, taking it a day at a time, unfortunately, for now. Yeah. How would those, I mean, how, what, give me an example of how a service cut would manifest to, to a resident. Would that be in terms of response times or, or what, what, you know, how would a citizen think about that? Um, it could be, so we had to let go of our, already our um, limited hour staff, our people that only worked hourly. And probably the biggest service hit that's going to be to is our front counter. So as we proceed, we're probably not going to be able to bring that, those staff members back. So it may result in one day a week where we're not going to be able to keep our front counter open because we don't have the staff to do it. So that's an example. Okay. What about the Measure C money? I know um, people voted for that in large part to, to get a new uh, headquarters for the, for the department. Uh, have you gotten any word on that, whether those funds will be required or not, or whether they'll be able to continue to go what they were intended for? Um, I, I know, I heard my boss uh, tell folks, hey, the police station was a priority to council and the community when they voted Measure C money in. Um, we're proceeding, we're, we're in the entitlement phase and um, in the env environmental review stage and the city's moving forward with that. So there's definitely going to be some reductions to the funds. They projected about 22 million a year through Measure C. It's clear there's going to be some reductions, but what that looks like um, hasn't been discussed. So because of where we are with the police station, that allows us to continue on with that yeah. project. Yeah, okay. All right, we just got a minute left, but I got to ask you, I, I, I went back and I was looking at some old uh, issues of the UCSD Guardian uh, <laughs> last night and the, uh, the Tritons winning in 1986. <laughs> that, you guys are pretty good. That was the third straight championship. I, did, I hadn't realized that. Yes, I was fortunate enough to play on three national championship volleyball uh, teams. So it kept me out of trouble, which allowed me to get into this profession. Well, there was a nice picture of you hugging the coach, Doug Danovic, that was on the front of the front of the sports page. I, and, and you haven't changed a bit, I have to say, from 1986 and that. So, and I also know you're, you're, you're kind of a CrossFit fanatic. So what, what's happened with your workouts during all of this? Um, you know what? I, I have had a great time because it's gotten me back to that old school garage gym kind of workout. And... I feel fortunate that I had a bunch of equipment. It was stacked in the back of the garage because I was going to some different local gyms, but I, I have a great driveway and I pull the equipment out and it's gritty, it's dirty, and it's a lot more weightlifting. And um, I've been able to maintain them, so I'm super happy. So do you do that when first thing in the morning or you do it to unwind when you get home? Usually first thing in the morning, and that could be about 5 a.m. So your neighbors are looking at that the driveway. Uh, you're out there. <laughs> when you were, well, you were what uh, pressing? How much? Uh, 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 oh gosh. Um, so I, I, I'm proud to say uh, when I turned 50, I and I'm going to be 55. So it was five years ago. I um, PR'd my deadlift at nearly 300 pounds. Wow. I am not there. <laughs> I was doing a workout with about 160 pounds the other day. So I'm on my way back though. I feel good. All right. Okay. Uh, any other th uh, message for the community or, or anything before we close? Um, I think just an appeal for everybody to be patient and recognize that you know, nothing's more important than our health and our safety. 
and to continue to look out for one another and be respectful and do what you can to uh, reduce your stress because this is, I know for a lot of people, a super stressful time and they have some significant economic challenges that are coming. So be a good neighbor and community member and the more that we stick together, I've seen a lot of it in this community. It's one thing that impresses me more than anything. Um, we are super resilient. So don't lose sight of that. You know, we will get through this together. All right. Chief Lou, uh, Lori Lou now, thank you so much for spending time with us this morning. Thank you, Jerry. All right. Stay safe out there. Of course. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.